during the Trump years, it was really nice living here because not a single person I'd ever come across in person in Vancouver ever said anything positive about Trump. It's just like <laughs> not a thing. And it's just really nice to be surrounded by people where you don't have to worry about like, do you think doctors should be allowed to let trans patients die on the table? Like, no, of course everyone here thinks no. What's up, everyone? I'm here today with possibly the most successful tournament player of all time, but definitely the number one on the all-time money list for Handed Bob for tournaments. 60 million, he's also won a lot of money in cash games too. He's beat me personally at Heads Up Poker back in the day in 2010 and 11. Uh, one of my arch nemesis <laughs> and now turned social justice warrior. Please welcome Justin Bonimo. Wow, that was one of the most interesting intros I've ever had. Thanks for having me, Jungle Man. All right, well, I'm happy to uh, hit some kind of notes. Are you a social justice warrior? Would, would that be a fair way to describe you? I mean, it's one of those terms that is just like, it's only used by people trying to make fun of someone. So, like, I don't use that term myself. Oh. But I, uh, certainly a lot of people call me that. Oh, well, like, there's a very common uh, theme. I didn't know how common of a theme it was until I looked into it, but there's a common theme of, like, someone being like a warrior for peace, like all these kinds of things, um, and spirituality, et cetera. I didn't, I wasn't trying to make fun of you with, by saying that, I thought that was just a fun way to, to say it. I mean, yeah, you're good. I, I know you didn't mean any offense. You're it's good. A, it's a bit of hyperbole, but uh, yeah. Um, so I want to ask a bit about, I know you were in poker through Magic the Gathering. Uh, you succeeded at many different formats. I know that you succeeded at Heads Up Cash Games. I think you've also won at Ring Cash Games, No Limit Ring Cash Games. I don't know if you played PLO as well. Maybe we played that. You beat me out of like 200 something thousand Heads Up. I knew this. I couldn't beat you to save my life in 2010, 2011. Um, perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit about how you managed to go from magic to going from all these other things. Like what propelled you to make these shifts sure um so i started playing magic when i was like eight by the time i was 13 14 i was getting pretty competitive at it competing in the junior tournaments mm -hmm. uh, when i was 14 i competed all along the east coast went to florida a couple times for the junior national yearly tournament mm -hmm. uh, and then when i was 16 i even went to europe a couple times for professional tournaments and these are tournaments you had to qualify for so i was okay. quite good and successful for someone my age at magic um, and then some of the older kids I played with, uh, namely Brock Parker, who many of you may know, uh, he started making a lot of money playing online. And I remember I used to watch him. Um, he would play on an old school site called uh, WSEX, World Sports Exchange, who's was playing 100, 200 limit hold'em. And like, as a 16 year old kid, that was all the money in the world. Just like every minute there was a $2,000 pot, like just going so quick. And I, I kind of thought like, Maybe I could make one tenth as much money as he was making. Like that was my goal when I first started. Yeah, I remember when I was that age, I lost like three thousand dollars, and I thought that was like <laughs> a ton of money. Or like, there's some kid making two thousand in a week playing fifty one hundred. I thought that was a lot of money. So yeah, those were the days when we thought um, like a few thousand dollars was a lot of money. Uh, yeah, things changed a little bit. Uh, did you make any money playing? Magic, by the way, it sounds like, because I know you can make money playing Magic. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an expensive game. I spent a lot, too. Um, I did win four separate $1,000 scholarships, so $4,000 in college scholarships. Um, part of the junior division was they didn't give you cash prizes, they only gave you scholarships. Uh, in the two professional tournaments I played, I never found any success, but, you know, small sample. Wait, did you say you get scholarships from Magic? Yeah, I don't know if they still do it, but that used to be the prize for the junior tournaments. All right, I had no idea they did that. That's, that's pretty mm -hmm. cool. I think I got a scholarship, but not for Magic. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess you went from... Did you play, Oh, you did play Limit Hold'em. That's right. I remember we talked very briefly about this. Did you enjoy it, or did you enjoy Heads Up Poker more? Maybe you just saw the there was more money in Heads Up, because there was a time when Heads Up Poker was really profitable. That was a big reason why... I shifted myself. Or did you follow these games from your passion or what? Yeah, it was kind of circumstance organic transition. Um, so I did start off as a limit hold'em player. 
Um, I actually got my first poker bind ever. I sold my by, I sold my level sixty EverQuest Druid for five hundred dollars on PayPal, and that's how I had my first ever poker buy-in. Uh, back in the days when you could use PayPal, um, I was sixteen, so I just all I did was I changed the year of birth on my information. Everything else was real: my name, my address, everything. Um, yeah, I played Limit Hold'em, fifty cent a dollar. Um, grinded up, played five ten shorthanded, fifteen thirty. Um, and then my bankroll was like five hundred dollars maybe, and I cashed for two thousand dollars in a twenty dollar tournament. And I just kind of got the tournament bug, like really liked it at that point. Um, and I kept playing Limit Hold'em, so I was playing both for a long time. Uh, and then Heads Up No Limit didn't come until years later. Uh, and honestly, the main reason why is I moved into Panorama Towers at the same time that Scott Siever and Isaac Haxton did, probably like, I don't know, 2008 or something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just learned so much from Isaac. Like, the way we thought about poker, the theoretical way we both thought about the game just clicked so perfectly. Um, and he had already been playing No Limit Heads Up, but I hadn't. And I just learned everything I could from him about No Limit Heads Up. He's a great teacher. It's one way to learn. Uh, definitely finding someone who's really good at what they do. I remember you even wrote Trust the Experts in, in uh, or just generally speaking, I think it was in regards to like i think it was in uh specializing in poker fields or i don't know what it was specifically although definitely when learning anything uh finding good experts i'm trying to figure this out figure that out now actually as i try to grow my podcast is finding the super experts in the podcast industry because there's more to this than it looks we live in an age where you can't specialize in everything and like you don't go to the doctor and say no, I don't want to cast around my broken leg. I think gelatin will work instead. Like you just listen to the doctor, you know? Yeah. And for some reason, people think they're the experts on certain things. Like they might think they're an expert on sports or poker or whatever, when they're really not. Mm -hmm. And yeah, my philosophy has just always been like, you can really shortcut the learning process by spending time and thinking about who you can actually trust, who you should listen to and then doing it. Oh no, absolutely. Now things are getting kind of complicated with you know, the information age and all these, uh, everyone trying to hustle in all different kinds of ways and make money online, first of all. Yeah, you're right. You absolutely have to look at incentives. Um, if someone is making money by being a poker coach, but not making money as a poker player, like that's their incentive. They just want to put content out to make money. So maybe they're not the best person to trust. Uh, certainly in the government and the medical industry, incentives are crazy and all over the place and it really complicates things unnecessarily. Um, yeah, huge problems there. Does this fall under the umbrella of social justice, by the way? Um, I mean, social justice, again, it's not really a term that I personally use, but like, I, I just try to be aware and honest about like what the world looks like and, you know, I do my part to make it a better place when I can. You know, I'm, I'm certainly not perfect and I can't fight every battle, but you know, I like to kind of steer discussions, thoughts in the right, distract, in the right direction when I can. I've seen it. I've seen you do that. Um, yeah, and getting back to you, uh, you've always su succeeded uh, really well in Heads Up. But from what I can tell, you crushed Heads Up. Uh, you pr probably won it limit Oldham too. You must have got, had money to play Heads Up from somewhere. And obviously done really well at uh, tournaments. Is it... I presume... Uh, what Can you tell more about what attributed to your great success there must be uh, you must have some kind of special talents of sorts i would think yeah i mean i've just always been obsessed with the game and not only poker but just games in general like i've been obsessed with games since i was eight years old so my brain has kind of been like trained to think about G games are kind of abstract sets of information and some people they're like the button raised is a small blind short stack. Like, what does that mean? And that just confuses them. But to me, it just makes sense and it helps. Like, I'm able to think very linearly. Okay, because this number's smaller, how does that impact my strategy? And I'm that way with every game. When I'm learning a game for the first time, I'm instantly trying to, to learn that language, to figure out what each piece of information means my strategy should do. There is some math in these games, but like, you know, when you're sitting at the poker table, you're not just doing like calculus all day long. 
Yes. It's a, it's a lot of chess-like thinking where you're thinking like, instead of five moves ahead, it's more like if I do this with my range and he does this with his range and these cards come out, like what does that overall strategy look like? If he's betting every flop, you know, how do I beat that strategy? And you're just kind of thinking of all the possible strategies and what you can do to stay one step ahead of the strategy you think your opponent is on. Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much the, the language of all of all high stakes players. And I think one thing that you're getting at is it's easier to be predisposed towards doing this when you grow up playing games. And just uh, this align this style of thinking and thinking in a coherent way does lead to it's kind of the premise of all successful poker play. Although I'm starting to realize that there might be something to do with all that. I think it's important for some for the viewers to kind of understand what they can do to perhaps try to emulate their success. Like there must be something more to that. Well, being obsessed is one thing to reach like the highest stakes in poker. If that's what their goal is, was that was that even your goal in the beginning, was, or was it just? No, when I was 16, I never ever thought that I would be, you know, number one in the world, 60 million in cashes. Like, I just thought it would be cool to make several thousand dollars and then see where it takes me from there. Um, mm-hmm. And it really, it only, I, I, I had only been playing for about six months by the time I was making more money than my parents. So, like, it, it just took off so fast. Like, I never thought I would be so successful so quickly at it. I did have, um, kind of a similar thing that happened except for me it took something like maybe a year something like that to start making more money than my parents it took me nine months to break even it it turns out that uh, a robust mental strategy of changing your mind super quickly based off of new information mm-hmm. is um a safer way to succeed at something but you forego many risks you forego many possibilities of making a ton of money, perhaps. Like, this is, would be the way that perhaps you would create your own game theory strategy. But I think my, I have an idea that perhaps, like, many of the top poker players have this going on naturally in their heads. Does this make sense? Uh, yeah, I can speak to a couple aspects of that. Um, there's certainly something to be said for someone who is able to change their mind. Yeah. Um, and you don't want to be the type of person who changes their mind like every time they hear something. You want to be the type of person That's who's true. able to like hear something, analyze it on a logical level, and then maybe change your mind. Not change your mind every time. Oh, oh you're absolutely true. Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. I'm um, just... Go ahead. Yeah, and one of the push pull that most great poker players feel is you have that first instinct. Usually, a decision pops in your head within one second, and then you spend some time like analyzing and thinking about it. And oftentimes, yeah, that first instinct is right. But sometimes it's just like you just want to fold that ace queen because you've lost five coin flips in a row. And you have to realize, like, no, I've got 12 big blinds. I'm not folding my ace queen just because I feel unlucky. And you, sometimes you have to be able to realize that, that that kind of superstitious thinking is exactly where that feeling comes from. Whereas other times a feeling might be based on, like, he seems really strong. His physical presence is really strong and I kind of have a subconscious memory of this meaning big pants in the past. So that would be the type of instinct, instinctual inter- information that you want to listen to, but other times you just have to ignore it. Right, so it sounds like what would be really useful is being aware of where your feelings come from, of why you want to fold, and having that kind of an internal awareness, is that right? Exactly, and being able to apply logic to that non-logical thing. Okay, okay. So we're going to use some logic to analyze our own feelings and see where they come from. Okay, okay. That does seem very, very, very super relevant to all high stakes poker. Um, I'm starting to have the theory that this might be applied to some other things, but I find that you're an interesting case because you have actually taken it um, to to apply to uh, other areas outside of poker, whereas a lot of poker players seem to be content just playing poker. Um, one more thing before we talk about some other stuff would you give any advice to some to some poker players let's say they're gamers or they're not gamers uh, would you give any kind of advice for them if they wanted to succeed at either high stakes and make some real money or succeed at a yeah just let's just start with that because it is super hard to succeed at the, at the highest stakes it's almost unrealistic yeah, I mean, most people don't like the first piece of advice I give them, which is 
are you sure you really want to play poker seriously? Um, I think, in my personal opinion, I think most people who try to get into professional poker end up regretting it. And yeah. I'm not only talking about the people who fail, because I do think 90 to 95% of people probably fail. But I even think out of the people who succeed, I think many of them end up with lives that are worse off because of poker. Really? I think it's, it's a really tough game. Not only is it hard to make a living, but like, it can wear down your soul. It's just like, it's so competitive. It's so brutal. You have to hide your emotions. I think there's a lot that's unhealthy about the lifestyle. Really? So you think um, even in the high stakes scene with the tournament guys that you know that you got that many of you guys are not, uh, well, I don't know about you, but many of the other guys are not so happy doing it? Well, I mean, now we're getting into survivorship bias because the guys that I hang out with are literally the like 0.001% most successful players. Yeah. Um, so. But even then, like many of them, many of my friends through poker have quit because they just like didn't find happiness in it. And many of the ones playing, like, you know, I wouldn't say, if you look at the top 30 players on Hendon Mob, I wouldn't say that those are, like, 30 incredibly happy people. Many of them struggle with depression, anxiety, and other things. Really? So you think it's, like, a high incidence rate? Like, what percent of successful tournament players um, have these kinds of problems? Um, yeah, again, I'm not going to go into numbers. Okay. Um, but I just don't see the happiest people in the world when I'm in a poker tournament, you know? Okay. Well, what about, um, well, you know, that's a great a transition to another subject, but uh, let's just start with, like, how happy are you with playing tournaments? I think you must be pretty happy, and, yeah, it seems like you're even pursuing other things, so it gives you the Yeah, my, my happiness from poker has changed a lot over the years. Um, about ten years ago, poker fulfilled me on, like, basically every level. All of my friends outside of poker were poker players, you know, just like I ate, slept, breathed poker. That was all I really cared about. Yeah. Um, yeah, but call it eight, ten years ago, I kind of discovered, like, there's more to life. Um, and I made a real point to make it so that I met, met a lot of friends that are non-poker players. Um, my most recent hobby is acro yoga or partner acrobatics. And I love it because it's the complete opposite of poker in every way. Instead of competing with people, I'm working against them. It's not, you know, 97% male. There's plenty of women there. Um, instead of sitting down all day, you're actually moving around, doing something that's incredibly healthy for you. You have to learn communication skills. You have to learn about, like, trust and keeping someone safe. Uh, so I absolutely love it. Um, most of my friends these days are in the Acro Yoga community, and they're just, like, awesome, wonderful, loving, open people uh, with a lot of behaviors you don't really see in the poker world. Like, poker players are very closed off, uh, so it's really nice to be part of such an open, loving community. Yeah, I mean, I have been exploring um, different avenues myself. Not that one specifically, only because, well, it was, it was clear that certain needs in poker were not satisfying me. Particularly, maybe you felt the same. Particularly, it, it felt like a very complicated version of running on the treadmill. But I think this is a, like a rat race, if that makes sense. Particularly when uh, I was playing tournaments, no offense. Um, <laughs> I mean, this has made me not really want to study because it just felt like I got to like wait till my due and like eventually it's going to be delivered, etc. And this is kind of what made me, in fact, start dressing up and acting crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, and ironically, I did pursue similar routes but not exact routes as yourself. I pursued yoga for a variety of reasons um, related to this, but more toward, more for me, it was more along the lines of self-realization, which is what yoga fundamentally is about. Um, I don't know a whole lot about acro yoga, but it sounds like, it sounds like that does apply. Um, I don't know how like serious about the theory it is. In addition, it occurred to me to, um, yeah, try things that have a nonlinear or a less predictable payout for doing things and also create, uh, create like some kind of value in some way that isn't, um, linear. It, it started to, I, I wonder if you had this experience yourself, but money, it, I, I started to look at money and my desire to accumulate money. First of all, that it couldn't scale, that was a big problem. Um, 
and secondly that it was kind of arbitrary. Do you know what I mean? It's like, why am I trying to like win this game, this precise kind of game in this abstracted way versus a game um, in a bigger way, which would be perhaps my own life fulfillment and social impact. Does, do these ideas resonate with you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think when you start chasing the poker dream that you think that your poker success will align with your happiness, and then you discover it kind of doesn't. And it takes, if you're a tournament player, it takes a while to discover that because maybe you're entering these 2,000 player tournaments and like how many spots are you going to be happy with? Most people aren't happy with an 8th place finish, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're already just like adding, you know, 90 whatever percent of your days are just going to end in disappointment depending on, you know, what form of poker tournaments you play. So that's already rough. Uh, but then sometimes, like, honestly, like, one of the more unhappy feelings I remember in my life was shortly after I won the Super High Roller Bowl in Macau. Um, you know, I was just kind of jet-lagged and underslept, and there was another tournament across town that, like, 100K or something that all my friends were playing, so none of them were there with me in the 300K. And I was just kind of alone and tired and depressed after I won this tournament. Um, and it's not the only time I felt that way. Um, I definitely don't feel like poker success necessarily always brings you happiness. Well, yeah, totally. Um, I think, by the way, for a lot of people it would, at least at various points in their life. And personally, what I've been trying to change is to make it more uh, colorful in the high stakes world. I mean, it's much easier on streams than in tournaments. Tournaments are uh, a bit more complicated. High stakes tournaments are really complicated. It would need probably a a change in incentive structure somehow to change it in high stakes tournaments but it might be possible at like 25k's or whatever to experiment a bit um, with these sorts of things and making them um, a bit more colorful I saw Will Jaffe took a took a shot at you saying you weren't much fun in the super high rollers or something along these lines do you have any aspirations to to uh, make poker more interesting, perhaps not in the context of these super high rollers? No, I'm just not incentivized to, you know. Um, okay. there, were, there was a time 10 years ago where I you know, was looking for sponsorship, didn't know what direction my career was going to go, and it kind of made sense for me to care about that stuff back then. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, I'm just kind of keeping my head down, studying, and then playing the best poker that I can in the toughest tournaments in the world. And that's not to say like I'm opposed to other opportunities, but you know, until they come along, until there's something pulling me in that direction, I'm just going to keep playing the best poker that I can. Fair enough. Yeah, very understandable. Um, I mean, yeah, I do think. I do think those tournaments might be too difficult to change. I, I will give them my best shot. I'll be the, uh, I'll be the the, the uh, spice of those tournaments and dress up and do stupid stuff. I think, I don't know if you guys can read me in between hands when I say some dumb things or check in some dumb way. Good job, really great job. I don't really buy it, but okay. Um, yeah, if you've yeah, got. I mean, it, it's not like so. Yeah, not wanting to be read is part of it, but a big part of it is I just have so much going through my head, and I can't hold on a conversation while like analyzing my opponent's range to the degree that I am. Like, I, I wish there was a way for me to clip what's going on in my head for like the one minute I was thinking, because I, I think a lot of people who just watch poker on stream they don't realize like we're not just sitting there for 20 seconds thinking about nothing. Like, there's a lot going on in their heads. Well, I could see that being true post-flop, but is it really true pre-flop? Um, it depends on the situation. There's some st tough ICM spots, um, figuring out what size to open to. Like, you need to know all the stack sizes after you, so that's one thing I'm keeping track of at all times. Uh, I'm watching players to see what they're doing physically. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say, like, I never fake, fake tank. Like, sometimes there's an all-in, and, like, yeah, I'm just going to wait 30 seconds, even with aces, of course. Um, so, so it depends. There, there, are, there is some fake thinking, but there's also a lot of real in-depth thinking as well. Right, yeah, yeah. No, for sure, that does make tons of sense. I think, I think at the very most competitive levels, they just have to... Something has to, you know, the, the entertainment factor has to give way for the... Um, 
competitiveness factor. I mean, that just seems inevitable in my eyes. But I think that there is room for some kind of entertainment factor on these streams and things like these. Whereas, like, you don't have to really keep track of people's stack sizes, for example, or ICM. Those things no longer become relevant, and maybe someone's high on MDMA as well. <laughs> that helps. And was is actually a, a true story, as it turns out. There's, on. there's also another factor that I think some people criticizing the pros don't realize, and that's that I actively do not want to be on the stream. If there's two tables being streamed, I want to be on the table that's not being streamed. So in that sense, I'm directly incentivized to not be entertaining. Like, I don't want people to see my cards. I don't want the added stress. I don't want to be in a situation where they take my cell phone away. Um, yeah, I, I don't want my opponents to be able to see my cards on 30-minute delay. Um, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why I just don't want to be on the stream. All right, well, well it looks like we're going to have to let these 100K super high roller tournaments with all pros be... Um, you know, let them battle it out in every single conceivable way possible on every mental way possible. Let that be. I wonder if there's a way to hyperbolize all that. To like, I, I have some ideas of making that like more of a thing, like making like a cartoon showing like all the things going on, like something uh, Sherlock Holmes asked. But that's my. Uh, we'll leave that up to me, I guess. Um, I do think, as you said, that the hardcore poker route probably is not perfectly for everyone. I do think um, I do think making a living could be really kind of the dream. I know many people that are quite happy making money from playing poker and make like good money. And I imagine that many people in developing worlds or developing countries or whatever, as long as the markets are good and the rake structure is good, this is like a realistic dream for many to aspire to if they're like playing video games or whatever and they just want to shift towards poker because gaming is becoming very popular. Do you disagree with that? No, I, I absolutely think that a lot of the successful poker players are happy. Um, no. But I think, I think again, we're getting into survivorship bias. Like we're forgetting about all those people 12 years ago that either failed because they weren't good enough or failed because they didn't have proper bankroll management or failed because they couldn't take the stress. Yeah, I mean, you are right, actually. It would be interesting to take a look at the, uh, the silent information behind all of that. I do think that it is easy for us to see the, the bright side. I want to talk a bit more about your uh, foray into uh, social justice. Where does that fit into, um, yeah, and, and also feminism and these sorts of things. Is this, one, I, I want to ask a question, is this where your interest lies now, maybe, or acro yoga? And two, um, well, you gave me the answer for acro yoga, but how did you get into these kinds of things? Yeah, it's weird. Like the, these issues don't come up in the acro community that often, mostly because we just all agree. Um, so, like consent is a very big thing in acro because not only are you touching people who are often strangers, but you're also doing dangerous things. So, consent needs to be like a very big part of it. Um, we also party pretty hard, and you know, situations where we're not wearing very much clothes, and so consent comes up in those situations a lot as well. Um, but things like feminism, it's just like. Let, let, let me put it this way. I, um, I spend most of my time in Vancouver these days. And it's just like during the Trump years, it was really nice living here because not a single person I'd ever come across in person in Vancouver ever said anything positive about Trump. It's just like not a thing. And it's just really nice to be surrounded by people where you don't have to worry about like, do you think doctors should be allowed to let trans patients die on the table? Like, no, of course everyone here thinks no. And it's weird going back to the U.S. where people are like, hmm, doctors should have the right to let trans people die. Like, what? Yeah, that uh, that one seems uh, hard to get behind. Um, I wasn't expecting that uh, as like a justifiable platform that people have is letting people just die on the butt. Yeah, I don't know about that one. Um, and, and I want to be clear to people, this is a real thing that's happening. Like Ron DeSantos it just put forward laws in Florida that makes it so doctors can deny healthcare to people because they are trans. And we're taking steps backwards. Like we shouldn't be allowed to to do that to Yeah, to judge people and treat people and save lives based on things like gender. I totally agree with you by the way. I one hundred percent agree. I think that this there's some layers to this that may be worth um, at least looking into a little bit. Um, and 
or at least contemplating as to what can be done. Um, but first, I do want to like redirect towards the question. It's like, what is it that was it just you being in Vancouver that sparked this interest in hearing this completely ridiculous point of view? Or was it something else that got you into uh, the more political side of things and thinking more about the injustices of the world and that sort of stuff? No, my, my principles have always been important to me since I was a teenager. I remember when I was like 12 or 13, mm -hmm. um, kids would make fun of other kids and, you know, gay was an insult. Like, you miss a basketball shot, someone might call you gay. Yeah, yeah I remember this, yeah. And I had gay friends, and I was like, why are we using that as an insult? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. And I, I was just always outspoken on all these things. Um, I had a lot of problems with uh, certain organized religions, so I would speak out on those from a young age. Mm -hmm. And I've just always been one to stand up for what I believe in. Like, a, a lot of people, they, they feel the need to silence their opinions so that they, like, fit in. Um, but I'm the opposite. Like, I want my weird opinions to be out there so that I can find people who believe the same things as me and, like, put that... I, I believe that the stuff that I stand for is just really good for humans, really good for the world, and so I want to put it out there, you know? Um, I, and I admire that. I admire that you're taking a stand and, and, say, and putting out your beliefs, and I like weird beliefs, too. Uh, even if... Especially ones that I believe in, to be fair. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I read quite a bit about, um, this is years ago, so I don't remember it super well, but I, I read a lot about um, one of the guys running Trump's campaign. And he was just one of the first people to realize that, like, not only does it not matter that much about whether or not what, you, what you're saying, whether it's true or not, uh, but also he was able to kind of tack it to hack into that data mindset and just, like, he would put all this stuff out there on Facebook and you would be able to see what got the most engagement. And he was, he was able to see that you want controversial things, doesn't matter if it's true or not, and just perfected the formula. And that was one of the reasons why Trump got elected, because he was so good at this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, with social media now, like now, now the cat's out of the bag, everyone knows the secret that like, Twitter doesn't make money by promoting things that are like, oh, I agree with it. It makes money by putting the really controversial things at the top of the feed. And sometimes it'll just be like some some silly fact. I'm trying to remember. There was an example I read the other day. It was just like s some simple number arithmetic thing. And some guy like retweeted this, like this is obviously wrong. And like people were enraged about this just like number problem being wrong. And it just went viral. And it's, <laughs> that's not going to happen about a math equation that's true, you know. It's just people being outraged and that's what spreads on the internet and it's a real big problem that we're going to have to deal with you're you're right but i want to point out two or three things first of all do you see what the end goal is of these engagement things and what's wrong with that um let's say i can i can see two end goals that you cite do you see what they are uh, I mean, mostly it's to make money. That's what Twitter cares about. For yes. for Trump, it was a little bit more complicated. He wanted to be president. He wanted to use the presidency to avoid going to prison. He wanted to fulfill his own ego, et cetera. Yes. Uh, in my view, all that is bad. Like, if, if Twitter's trying to make money, all this stupid shit will happen, and it sacrifices all these other values that sacrifice the wealth of the uh, society. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Like it, It's causing immense problems, and I think it's only getting worse. And then the other thing we haven't even talked about is the addiction, because like it's a, it's a deep human emotional hormonal thing where we are addicted to this controversy. We are addicted to like clicking on that link because we want to see how bad it is. And Facebook and Twitter, they've really perfected getting us literally addicted to it. Yeah, that's that's very true. I mean, I still think, I still think basically all of this is like. This is, I mean, this is what has been going through my mind. All of this is essentially chasing this, like, false high of, like, getting, like, a, the equivalent of, like, a big stack in poker. Like, that's what the, the ego version of it would be. Like, and then that being, like, the version of happiness. But the problem with that is, like, okay, once you've got that, and you, it seems like you've felt this already, it's like, okay, what, what now? I've got the big stack. Like, there's nothing else. And now i got to get a bigger stack. And now i got to get a bigger stack. And it's like... Well, there's got to be something else. And it, it's not just social media. I think it goes back to just capitalism in general. 
because we've seen pe people chasing false dreams ever since you know you had advertisements in magazines people thinking that you know if they buy that big car that's going to bring them happiness yeah and in america in the united states specifically i think we are very overly focused on our 50 hour work weeks and not enough on just like friends and connection and human touch and sharing our feelings and things that like actually bring happiness there have been a lot of studies on happiness and yes money does add some amount of happiness especially up to the point where you can pay for like your basic needs your food your health care etc after yeah. that it brings still some happiness but very little one of the things that has been proven to correlate extremely highly with happiness is communal living just being around people that you love and trust and we're just not focused on that in the united states unfortunately yeah, I do think there's a bigger, bigger shift away from those things in the U.S. It, at least that's what I've noticed. But I've also been in like Los Angeles and Las Vegas where you can really see this. Maybe that's where you're located. Oh, you're in Vancouver. That's right. Canada. Yeah, I have, I, I have a full time apartment in Vegas because I play so much poker there. But like Vancouver is where all my friends are. This is like the place that you know, I want to be my home. Um, I do think a big shift has gone toward that. And by the way, uh, yoga. Uh, and many of these philosophies essentially do advocate these things, although it's not written. These Eastern philosophies especially advocate these things, but it's just not written in exactly the same format. Well, one thing I want to point out is that same thought process that you had, or the same things that made you good at poker, this whole idea of like looking at what someone's counter strategy is and looking at a you know, what you should do versus the range and what they should do versus the range could be used in some kind of way to effectuate um, potentially social change because it's actually a very similar um, pattern that exists. Yeah, but it's complicated. Um, oh, it's super complicated. One thing I struggle with is I know I'm an extremely logical, rational person, yes. but most people aren't that way. Yeah. Uh, like I use my words very literally and most people aren't that way. Um, and, and I always have the instinct to just throw facts at people because like that's how I learn, that's what I pay attention to. But yeah. that's not actually how you convince people. And a lot of people look at what activists are doing and they, they say things like, oh, that's not effective, that's not effective. But like, you're talking about it. When they're protesting, when they're causing a ruckus, like that actually is how a lot of change is made. If you look at most of the civil, liber civil liberties movements, whether you're looking at Gandhi or MLK or Malcolm X, they were all about making a big stink. They they wanted to be disrupted. And I think there's a lot of truth in that you need to be disruptive if you want to make big change. Yeah, and, and I think it depends on what kind of change you're trying to make. So if you were talking about AI, you know, it's been a subject on people's minds because ChatGPT, AI is like really advancing. And there's a chance that AI might just overthrow and kill the human race. And some yeah. people are very concerned with that. Um, and so for people who are concerned with that, they might flock to the rationalist, the rationalist community. And there you have a lot of computer programmers, a lot of people working in AI, and those are going to be incredibly logical people. And I think that is one arena where, yeah, logic will prevail. Um, but I think there are other arenas where, you know, that's just not going to be that effective. So I think it depends. I, uh, I don't think it will prevail, honestly, in the AI arena. It'll prevail with AI, but I won't, pre won't prevail with I don't think it will prevail with the people that make AI and want to use it, if you, is my personal view, because um, I think that if you really look at people's actions, um, there are many, what I, what I would call um, many social strategies that do sacrifice values too much in order to, or sacrifice certain virtues too much in order for the sake of greed and don't, for example, value security nearly as much as they should. I myself had this issue. It's impossible to tell where AI will go. So it's super, super easy to not put in place the uh, the appropriate super, um, the appropriate, uh, what is it? Security precautions for AI in 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 favor of, you know, the, the tremendous upside of, oh, we've got like a supercomputer and it can make tons of money for us kind of thing. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I just want to clarify, when I said logic will prevail, I meant if you're on these rationalist forums, like it, people will listen to logic in their discussions. I'm certainly not saying that logic will solve the problem of companies creating evil AI. And you're absolutely right. Like, 
someone will get rich off AI. Like, there's no question about that. It will happen. It will probably be many people making many, many billions of dollars. And so it's really hard to say, like, please don't make billions of dollars because there's huge risk associated with it. So that will stop some people, sure. There's always going to be someone who says, I don't care if there's a 5% chance this kills a human race. In fact, I think it's only 2%. I'm going to make billions of dollars, even though I might cause the destruction of the planet. You know, there's always going to be someone willing to take that risk. And that's a huge problem. I absolutely agree. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people like that. Um, I don't know how to... That's, that's a really tough problem to solve. This is kind of why I, I did start doing this, even though it's like a long shot of... of well, I wanted to create a movement, essentially, but, like, you know, it's a bit tough. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it goes back to really where the source of all these things is. That being said, I want to um, uh, I want to uh, talk a bit more about where your, I mean, are you actually focused on making these differences yourselves? Are you, like, on these forums yourself? Are you, like, battling in the, in the, um, Vancouver, are you, well, you're not out there protesting, I presume, or are you? How far? Yeah, I, huh? I've been to a handful of protests. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, th there's not too many in Vancouver. Um, I went to the day after Trump was, I can't remember if it was his election. No, it was his inauguration. Uh, there was one of those um, pink hat women marches. And so, like, I went to that, for example. Oh, okay. Um, I, I've been to a couple in Vegas as well. Um, I, honestly, I don't think it's the best use of my time in terms of making change. I do think it's a really good use of my term, my time in terms of educating myself. Uh, yeah. One thing people who have never been to a protest might not realize is like there are very intelligent, educated, experienced speakers of these things. Really? Uh, yeah. And I've learned quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I don't think like... So, so part of the reason why I am so vocal is because I do have this platform of more than 40,000 Twitter followers. And I, I think I do have an obligation, a moral obligation to use my voice for good rather than evil. Um, so that is one thing that influences my decisions. Well, good for you. I, I had a similar line of thinking, in fact, at least I try. Uh, it's a bit complicated to actually get people on board. Uh, although I did realize that the people that would resonate with your ideals tend to be the people that follow you as well. So there's that. Um, yeah, I never knew that there were really educated speakers there. You're always surprised once you go down the rabbit hole. I almost went to a protest myself, a, uh, protesting the injustice in Iran in um, the United Kingdom. I, I didn't do it, but I didn't like understand where it was at exactly. How did I don't know how to protest, Justin? You might need to coach <laughs> me on how to protest. I don't. I don't this, this is new for me. Uh, but I'll, I'll protest. Huh? You just show up with an open mind and listen. Like uh, honestly, go at least once just for the experience. And if you don't like it, don't go again. That's fine. But I think you would. I think you would enjoy just having that novel experience to add to the collection. All right, that sounds. That's up my alley. I thought it was kind of the opposite. I thought I was supposed to get really angry and say like, "No more violence in Iran" or something along those lines. I thought uh, there's, there's there's definitely a time and a place for that, right? Yeah, and um, so th these protests are generally organized by a leader or a group of people, and they will tell you like, "We're gonna block this building entrance," or "We're going to do this shout," or "Sing along to this song," or "Walk from this location to this location." So it's not like if you show up, you don't, you're not going to be burdened with like coming up with strategy plan. There's someone there who's already thought about it, you know. So you know, this is the same kind of thought. This is the so, This is sort of a similar thought process in poker. It's just, it's like literally creating a strategy to like create a ripple in someone else's range in a strategic sort of way, where they presumably don't like, you know, retaliate in a bad way. But you're able to do this these days in the U.S., so that's cool. Um, that's what I find really interesting is it's not that far off. Uh, it just requires to really create social change is very complicated. But that being said, maybe me going to a protest is perhaps what's required of that um, or maybe an enlightening experience. Yeah, since you're, you're trying to connect like disruption and change to poker, like we, we should talk about the recent example that was very successful in the poker community. GG raised the wake on high stakes players. 
So they coordinated together and they're like, how could we show that we're upset? How can they disrupt the market? Because if they didn't disrupt the market, GG would just keep collecting the money. And yeah. they collectively use their power to boycott the high stakes games. So GG was making less money. And yeah. through that disruption, GG gave in and said, okay, you guys are right. We'll do a 90% reset on the rake, go back closer to what it used to be. And yeah, I think that's a perfect example of how you can strategize and use disruption to make positive change. You're right, actually. That is actually, you know what? That's actually a very good point. I um, should probably see into that more. I did actually only recently hear of this boycott, but I realized in my head, wait a second, like too much rake will probably be bad for poker in the long run. I said something myself, by the way, to uh, to someone in GG, trying to like gently uh, tell them like, hey, I don't know if this is a good idea because, you know, if you're but I'm really, it's actually pretty cool. I thought it was really promising that the boycott worked and that they actually did listen because, um, I mean, they probably would have made, well, I would have presumed it was a decision that wasn't purely based off of money, right? Um, I presume it was also a decision, well, maybe they made less money, but like they probably figured they were going to make more money in the long run if they kept higher rake. I don't really know what their financials looked like, but it sure seemed to me that they, seem to care about what the players thought beyond just money, or am I mistaken? Uh, so you're talking specifically from the player's motivation standpoint? No, GG's motivation to change. The yeah, yeah, no, GG, they only care about money, for sure. Oh. Um, I, I honestly believe that back in the Poker Stars days, that Isai Scheinberg really cared about the community and cared about the game. Yeah. I, I think he is the one exception to the rule. I think every other poker operator that I've ever learned about met studied, played on their site, whatever, I think they're clearly motivated by money. And really, the only question is, are they motivated by money in the short term, the medium term, or the long term? Because that is what influences their decisions. Uh, when you saw like poker stars, after they sold the company and Eastside didn't have it anymore, and they screwed all over all the supernova elite players by not paying the money that they promised to pay them, they were clearly worried about the short term and not the long term. Um, yeah, how, however, they did have the long-term in mind. Their long-term plan was basically, we don't care about the pros. We just want to turn our product closer to slot machines. And that has been their long-term goal, unfortunately. It's terrible right. for both. Well, that's also just caring about the money. That's not caring about the players. It's, uh, yeah, and they're not, I, I think they're not doing so well. It's hard to say. Um, I, I, I mean, they lost their market share to GG. Like, GG has become the number one poker site in the world. And it's because they... They took advantage of poker stars screwing over their customers and not caring about the pros, you know? It does really look that way from my perspective. I mean, one interesting thing, by the way, uh, I'll get to it in a second. I It does look like, it does really look like uh, caring about the short-term value, or the uh, only the short-term values does eventually hurt the, uh, the short-term values themselves. Uh, in a lot of cases, not all the cases, um, I, I've been looking in to see if this is really true or not, but this seems this seems very often true, and certainly it hurts some things that you might not. Uh, usually, those people aren't ideally, you know, wanting to be hurt. As it turns out, it's pretty easy to not pay attention to you know, things like being uh, appreciated in society uh, when you like uh, try to steal lots of money from people and that kind of thing. Um, all this, by the way, I mean, I still, I, I, I'm really tempted to advocate the, the Eastern philosophies because they all basically predict these sorts of events, um, just in different languages. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a different subject. Do you know anything about that stuff? Does that interest you? Because you're doing Acrio, which is probably uh, a shift from yoga. Yeah, um, to be honest, a lot of people in uh, Acro Yoga think that like yoga shouldn't be part of the name because it's not that similar. Um, but I do, I do really like a lot about uh, Buddhist philosophies, mm -hmm. uh, and I find that to be very useful as a poker player. A lot of Buddhism is just about like acknowledge reality and just be at peace with it, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really helpful at the poker table. Um, yeah, you took your bad beat. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, he hit his two outer. Yeah, you're a short stack now. Like, okay, that's reality. Just acknowledge it. You don't need to say it's good, it's bad. That is reality. Just be at peace with it. 
And I find that mindset to be really useful at the poker table. Honestly, I, I use that to, as like a meditation way to like deal with pain. When I stub my toe, I like, I, I focus on the reality of it. I'm like, my toe hurts now. It hurts really badly, uh, but it won't. It's not forever. And I just have to be at peace with what's happening right now. And I find that that actually makes, call it 60% of the pain go away. Well, that would be like the idea of minimizing pain, of like reducing. It's like instead of with poker, you're trying to reduce your money lost, right? Uh, you're trying to cut down your leaks. In this case, your leak would be pain. You're trying to reduce the pain uh, would be my personal way of looking at it. Yeah, say? I think part of it is just like don't be in denial. Don't fight it. Um, just be at peace. I, I think there's a lot of peace in just acknowledging things and accepting them. In, um, I'm curious where your interest in, in, um, in your interest in uh, feminism and polygamy uh, comes from. Is this also a Vancouver thing? Uh, no, not at all. Um, so um, first, um, polygamy has a bad connotation because that often means that um, men can have multiple wives, but not the other way around. Um, I, I practice polyamory. Uh, which just oh, means, me. okay. yeah, it's all good. Um, polyamory just means multiple loves. And there are some people who like learn about polyamory and have to work at it. I'm not one of those people. I was the type of person who like, all around me, monogamy never made sense to me. I, everyone I saw, they would swear they would be together their whole lives to God, and then they would just get divorced. Like I saw yeah. divorce rates were through the roof. From my perspective, everyone was just lying to themselves. And even when I was younger and I was happy in a relationship, like I would still be attracted to other women. Like I would love to make out with that girl over there at the party. And I don't because I'm restricted from doing that by like the laws of society. Um, and that always felt weird to me. And th th I was also never possessive. I was like, if my girlfriend was attracted to another guy, um, I would think that like, yeah, that would be cool if like, we were able to hook up with the people we wanted to, and I wouldn't want to stop my girlfriend from doing that because I want the same thing. So why would I be mad at her for wanting the same thing that I do? But I didn't know that polyamory existed. I didn't know that like open marriages were something that like healthy, responsible people did. And basically the first time I heard the word polyamory, I was instantly like, that's me. There was no part of me that's like, I have to kind of change myself to fit in. Like that was already myself. And it was just the most natural transition ever for me. Yeah, I do think these days it's kind of, um, it's prob I think it's probably almost a necessity these days in some kind of way. Um, my personal jury is not 100% out, but I do think that, uh, I mean, it, it resonated with me quite a lot, although I started to think in a different direction. I um I I definitely resonate with the idea of like yeah of course like if if you you should be open to pursuing what you want and finding out if that's that's really what you want and that kind of thing and certainly allowing the other party to as well. I definitely think there's a lot more territorialism. Is that the word? Territorialism um, these days and a lot more, uh, double standards, et cetera, that are created by people not, um, being open and also by not, uh, being fair towards their partners and not really like being able to emotionally handle, uh, what happens with certain things. Yeah. I think it's important to think about like where those feelings come from. Like society teaches us that we are less of a man if our girlfriend kisses someone else or is even attracted to someone else. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we're programmed with so many unhealthy beliefs like that. Oh, yeah. Um, well, and I think there's a lot of growth involved in, you know, opening yourself up to other possibilities. And I'm certainly not saying everyone out there should become polyamorous. But I do think there's a lot that monogamous people can learn from polyamorous blogs and books, for example. Um, jealousy, for example, it's... It's just like anger. It's an emotion we also experience. It's fine. It's healthy. It serves a purpose. Um, but if you're experiencing a lot of it and it's making you do crazy, irrational things, then it's just like anger. It's something you can work on. And if you just have a little bit, bit of it, then that's fine too. It's something you can talk about and learn where it comes from and be at peace with it. 
No, I think they are very similar. I think all the uh, excessive versions of emotion where they become uh, in the crazy category of causing all kinds of problems are they're essentially the same. And I can definitely see how the openness of polyamory, uh, especially, I, I'm not well educated on the subject, obviously, but I can see how that, I know a little bit about it um, because I've met people that are poly uh, and dated them and that sort of thing. But I could see how that could be really relevant to a lot of monogamous relationships that have all kinds of problems and people don't seem to value things like honesty very much uh, these days and, uh, you know, create all kinds of bad, bad, uh, I mean, I just call them bad social strategies personally, but that's just me, but create all kinds of problems in the long run. Um, I think that, you know, the thing you said about like you be, someone being less of a man is a very common very common social manipulation. I mean, also on the other side too, like, uh, like women being oppressed by the patriarchy and all this kind of stuff. At least in certain contexts, I can't speak so much for women's experience, though I'm not exactly a woman, unless I decided to go that route. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're definitely right that patriarchy is a big part of it. And if you, if you just think of like human evolution, we have had a lot of success by like teaming up into different sex and just like amassing power for those sex and keeping power when i say sex i mean s-e-c-t-s mm -hmm. um and just amassing power for that those groups and i think that's part of the reason why religion has been so successful because it really creates an us versus them mentality and, and i think patriarchy has been a lot of the same thing like men have amassed a lot of power and they have their like boys club and it's a way of holding on to the, the power and the end group. And a lot of politics are just like, should we keep our group as the powerful, successful ones? Or should we like share that with other people? And of course, you know, I think in the year 2023, we have enough resources that like every child in the US should be able to eat lunch every day. Um, some people think that's a crazy socialist belief, but that's what I personally believe. Um, I, I definitely agree that a lot of that has been, I think, I think those, I mean, I look at it a little bit differently. I do see how the, I do see how um, the patriarchy uh, and these sort of uh, crystallized political institutions have, um, they've amassed like essentially the equivalent of like big chip stacks and they want to keep those big chip stacks there. Um, and they're not so willing to share parts of their chip stacks with someone else. Um, and I do think that that, I think that the underlying current of that, uh, of some version of competition and some version of, I want to say there's some kind of force that pushes the competition in these sorts of ways, but it's similar to, from my perspective, it's similar to like the forces of nature and just like the forces of, uh, things that are different that cause people to be pushed in this kind of direction. But I don't really. I'd have to give clear examples to, to show. Um, but I do think that's what eventually pushes society forward. I mean, I do think that, for example, th it's not a coincidence that that men and women, there's two genders or whatever. I mean, there's more than two, I guess. Uh, <laughs> no, there's, uh, there's more than two genders to be, more than one gender is what I mean to say. <laughs> <laughs> and that this, the force between all the genders pushes society in a positive direction. I think there's not a coincidence that that's the case. Um, but like, does society benefit from having multiple genders? Yeah, no, no, I, I absolutely do. And like, again, uh, going back to evolution, like there's a reason why there are multiple genders. Um, I obviously think women add a ton of value to this world, uh, men do as well. Um, I'm, so, some people think feminism is about hating men and like, no, absolutely not. When I speak out against toxic masculinity, it's not that I think masculinity is toxic. I think that some talk, some masculinity is toxic. It's like For water sure. is good, toxic water is bad. Masculinity is good, toxic masculinity is bad. Yes. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm very big on like, we, we don't need to live in the 1900s view of what it means to be a man. Like if you don't know how to change a tire, like that doesn't make you any less of a man. I agree. And especially in, in today's world, there's a lot more to being a man than there used to be. Like sharing your feelings is a big, important thing in society. Like going to therapy, that wasn't an option 200 years ago. But now it's actually a very healthy, positive thing to do.
It, it, it sounds like kind of a controversial opinion to say what I'm about to say. Um, Let's say it, please. I do think that it is really hard to be an adult male in America right now. And that's kind of a taboo thing to say because, like, you know, white men do have a lot of privilege. And that's absolutely true, too. But there's a reason why male suicide rates are so high right now, because it is really tough. Um, but the thing is, I think the solution to that problem is honestly listening to women more. Um, so, you know, I was talking about going to therapy, for example. I think suicide rates would be a lot lower if men just felt secure enough to go to therapy. Um, I, I do think dating is incredibly tough for men. Um, but I think the solution to that is like learning to listen to women and like what makes them happy. Like yeah. there's a lot of men, there's a lot of men who like won't talk about consent because that's not a manly thing to do. Uh, but I think turn it into a manly thing to do. Um, talking to a woman about like what you sexually want to do with her. If you're like, if you are confident about it, if you are experienced in it, and if you can do it in a way that is appealing to her, then that's incredibly sexy. And that will actually help you out in the dating arena rather than hurt you. Um, I could see how there's truth and, and some things that are not so true about that, um, that can lead guys to their, their doom. Because I've heard some of the things from Roman too, and I've certain absolutely thought to myself, there must be truth to the other side. Where is it going with this? I think a lot of average guys just have no idea what they're doing, uh, and it's like super hard to like compete with guys that really do know what they're doing, like guys that know how to seduce, know how to like take the lead, know how to uh, how do you say, know how to take them out, know how to like talk properly to them when they're sitting there playing video games and that kind of thing. Now, of course, girls have a different kind of problem. Is they've got to like, they've got to like filter through a million guys, and there's all these guys that objectify them and lie to them and do all sorts of stuff. There's all these guys that like are into it for the chase, and they, uh, they, <laughs> they like say these things. Oh, I'll never leave you, and then like two weeks later, it's it's over, and that kind of thing. That's my understanding. But I do think the solution has some kind of. Uh, has, there's some kind of like way in which for the sexes to somehow connect properly in an authentic way that uh, would lead to a solution, I think. Well, one thing that I feel a lot of people don't realize is that I think the feminist mindset does lead to people having more sex. And, and I'll give you an example. If you take one extreme, on one side you have the old school way of thinking, which is it's bad for women to have sex. They should get married and only have sex with that person. Um, but now a big part of the feminism movement has been allowing women to be more in touch with their sexual self. They're allowed to have many sexual partners. Yes. Um, and, and so you brought up friendship. Um, you're, you're definitely right that a lot of, especially like old school circles, like if you're friends with a girl first, that can cause problems. But personally in my circles, um, where people are polyamorous, where people are going to kink parties, where people are going to play parties, there's a lot of people who are friends who are just like, it would be fun to hook up with my female friend. Like, why not? Let's do it. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something the world should strive for more. Uh, but more commonly, like, we'll just have like little makeout sessions or whatever, and they're, they're just fun. And sometimes it elevates to escalates to sex and sometimes it doesn't. But like, I love having female friends who there aren't these like strict walls with like we can play with each other we can have fun and we can be friends at the end of it or maybe it can turn into more um I, i'm speaking from experience when i say that like being a friend with someone doesn't have to mean that there's no touch that there's no play on the table oh, for sure. um and i think that's one of the things we can learn from the self-positive movement that even conservative men would benefit from if they were able to incorporate it in their lives does that uh, make sense yeah it totally does make sense and i definitely think there's a lot of this extreme conservatism it's not really doing anything good for anyone, to be fair. Um, it's not so good to deny things like rampant sexuality and or if someone's really sexual, they like kind of should just, you know, embrace it, I would say. Because I mean you can see all the time people people's like denied sexuality comes out in strange ways. Yeah, and and, and I do wanna acknowledge um two things you're talking about, because they are some things that men feel that feminists often miss, um, but you're right about them. Um, it can be really frustrating um, for men to not be able to find a woman to date, to find a woman to touch, to find a woman to connect with, to find a woman to talk to, to find a woman to have sex with. 
That's a problem that many men struggle with uh, in some cultures more than others. Um, and you're right about the fact that um, we can use Tinder as an example. 10% um, of men are getting, I don't know if it's 90% of the women, but it's absurdly lopsided. Um, and it's really hard to be someone in like the bottom half of the population. Um, and so, yeah, I want to acknowledge like both those things are true. Um, however, I still think the answer is kind of becoming more progressive, becoming more in touch with feminism, listening to women more. Um, one example is um, giving a woman an orgasm. Like that's something women want. A hundred years ago, it was bad for men to give oral sex to women. That was a bad thing for a man to do. You're not a man if you do that. Um, and that's not true anymore. We need to move past these old things and like learn how to make the, your partner happy. Um, I definitely I, agree I with that. That's something that like should be obvious. But a lot of men have this thing like, oh, women don't know what they want. I'm going to be a real man and not listen to them. Like, hopefully you're dating someone because you actually think she's smart and you respect her opinions. So, like, maybe try listening to her and try to work with her to give her what she wants. Call me crazy. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I agree. Also, most of those perspectives of these, like, what a real alpha is or whatever it is, is, like, completely whack. Do you have... Is there a particular reason why you decided to dye your hair pink? Are you open to other colors? Yeah, so it, it started as a kind of a happy accident. I actually dyed it red for Burning Man in 2014, I think it was. And then the sun kind of faded it to pink. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, I really like the pink. And over time it came to represent a political message to me. Um, and it's largely a, it's a protest of forced gender roles and a protest against toxic masculinity. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big, so I, I've never been someone who's felt like I feel more like a woman. I, I've always felt like very strongly, like I, I'm a man, I'm very comfortable in my body, never felt gender dysphoria. But I felt that the other way that people saw what it meant to be a man was not in line with my way of what it means to be a man. Uh, I, so like, I think confidence is a good thing, but I think confidence should make it easier for you to help other people. I, I don't think bullying people, for example, is a confident thing. I think that's something that comes from insecurity. And the confidence that I have leads me to help other people out rather than feel forced to, you know, lower their status to make me feel better about myself. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And I completely agree. There's not really a whole lot of logic behind bullying, etc. I mean, actually, this thing that the Buddhists said uh, that compassion is the root to solving all, all the world's problems. I mean, if you look at all the world's problems, it seems like that really is the real answer to creating a more beneficial uh, collective benefit from everyone. Um, that's what I've noticed, at least from my analysis of looking into these situations. And by the way, I also agree that gender roles should not be forced into one thing or another. There's clearly a spectrum of like, someone who's more male or female or whatever it is and i mean that's obviously just true it's, it's, it's like ridiculous to uh typify these kinds of things I'm, I'm curious what the solution would look like on a grand scale for society because there's all kinds of problems these days but if any of this helps that would be fantastic um do you have any last things you'd like to talk about we've, we've gone on for quite a lot of time anything you'd like to promote uh um I, I do want to touch on like finding the answer because I do think the answer's out there. Um, I think we have a lot of data. Uh, one of the number one reasons I'm a progressive is because I use data. You know, it, we could come up with any number of ways to measure like what's the best country in the world. You could look at life expectancy. You could look at poverty rates. You could look at education. You could look at infant mortality. And almost across the board and all these things that we, we would agree on are good things, the U.S. is rated like somewhere between the 15th and the 20th best country in the world. Um, and I find that if you look at the top countries, like they are more progressive, they are more feminist, and they do provide health care to citizens, um, they have fewer guns. So I, I certainly think we could learn a lot from that. The number one thing that I think represents my political beliefs in the world, the number one word for it is just compassion. I think compassion is like a really strong quality in a person, whether you're, regardless of what your gender is. Um, and, and that's really what I want to stand for at the end of the day. 
Um, I think there's so much more room for compassion in how we treat like one other person, how we vote on a political level. Um, I think it's really what the world needs today. I agree too. I think I have the suspicion that it will lead, it will, uh, this will be seen on a grander level at some point um, with things all scaling, um, all the powers essentially scaling. But I hope that what you say is really true. I, I, per, I aspire for a world to exist where everyone gets their needs met and everyone, you know, is self-reliant and like works on themselves and like is able to provide value for their other partners and literally does ask that question, uh, what value do I provide? But I don't think that's the way that the world is working at this moment. All right, well, thank you for your time, Justin, and uh, good luck crushing poker some more. All right, thanks so much for having me, Dan. It was a blast.